All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. If you're looking for the webinar with the title, Five Steps to Delivering Seamless Business Continuity, we're going to allow a few more folks to join, and then we'll go ahead and get started. This is part of our webinar series here at Aruba, a Hewlett Packard Enterprise company. My name is Anthony. You've probably heard me before, uh, as I've been running the program here at Aruba for the last uh, two years. Uh, this is uh, not part of our free AP webinar program, but uh, we are excited to have you join us today. Uh, we know that a lot is going on in everybody's lives, both professionally and personally, uh, but uh, we're excited to bring you this webinar. Uh, uh, James Robertson is going to be delivering it. We're going to allow another, probably another 20 seconds or so as we see more people entering right now. So uh, bear with us for about 20 seconds, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you for joining us today. My name is Anthony. I am the uh, program manager for our, our webinar program. We usually deliver uh, twice monthly webinars that uh, cover uh, business challenges that uh, companies face and the technology answers uh, that they might consider uh, with Aruba and uh, just overall uh, helping them understand how to solve those challenges. I'm excited to be here today as I'm with uh, James Robertson uh, from Aruba to discuss the five steps to delivering seamless business continuity. Before we hand it over to James, I just have a couple of items I'd like to mention regarding your Bright Talk platform. And we do uh, greatly appreciate your feedback uh, and have modified our webinar program over the last two years based on that feedback. So if you think, oh, no one's going to read my feedback, that's absolutely not the case. I read them, and uh, I sometimes reach out to those who give the feedback uh, and we've made modifications to really fine-tune this program so it works for you, the audience. Um, questions and answers. Typically, we offer Q&A and answers during the course of the webinar. Uh, because we have such a large number attending today, we are going to reserve that for the end, get to as many questions as we can. Uh, James will try and answer as many as we can. And as we always do, for those we don't answer, we will reach out to you directly via email uh, that you use to register for this webinar. Uh, so we will answer all of your questions. We appreciate you attending. And uh, now uh, it is my pleasure to introduce James Robertson. Uh, James is going to take us uh, the rest of the way, well, at least until I join you for some housekeeping items <laughs> at the end. So, so remember, ask your questions at any point during the webinar. We'll answer them at the end. And James, thanks for joining us today, and uh, take it away. Absolutely. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so I, I'm just going to talk a little bit today about a few things, um, some five steps that I think are important at this time for us to think about uh, with uh, what's been going on. And then at the end, like Anthony says, I have an opportunity for you to ask some questions. Um, so you know, these are unprecedented times um, that we're living in. You know, there's really no script uh, for what we're facing right now. Um, there's no plans um, that we've uh, been able to uh, put together. Um, you know, there's no real guidance that we can uh, kind of lean on uh, in, in what I would call this modern technology-enabled era, right? So there's a lot about this current situation um, that we don't know. But you know, what I do know is that the technology community in which we operate in, which we are part in, you know, is special. Um, it's, it's incredibly resourceful. Um, it's very purposeful, uh, and it's somewhat unrivaled. Uh, we always think independently, and uh, we work very creatively for the betterment of our organizations uh, using the technology that we try and deploy. So you know, I want to keep that in mind as we work through the next uh, few minutes together. You know, I feel that we can probably use these skills you know, in this current situation and navigate these un uncertain waters um, for all of our companies, our customers, our partners, and our employees. Um, so, you know, bear with me. We'll go through this, and hopefully uh, you'll get something, something interesting out of it. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, for those that don't me, and probably most of you don't, uh, let me quickly introduce myself. My name, again, is James Robertson, and I'm part of the CTO organization at Aruba. Uh, prior to joining Aruba um, around 18 months ago, 
Uh, I spent most of my career up to that point, almost 21 years in fact, heavily involved in the technology side of the media and entertainment industry. Uh, I held roles across the plethora of technology spectrum from you know, being a, a security engineer to a network operations guy to a network engineer to a head of infrastructure, vice president. Uh, I ran multiple different aspects of our broadcast uh, technology stack during that time and ended up as the CTO um, for our shared services organization across the media vertical. Um, so, you know, I've been involved in all kinds of roles over that part of my career, but, you know, I always had a simple operational uh, mindset that I, uh, that I worked with, solving business problems as pragmatically as possible through the creative use of technology. That's, that was really key and, and helped me stay grounded during my entire career to this point. So um, my team had a nickname for me, and it's not a particularly flattering nickname. They called me Hurricane James. Um, as usually where I was, there was something major happening, and that's partly because my team got involved with some of the world's largest events over the last 20 years, everything from royal weddings uh, to multiple general elections and political events, uh, terrorism, wars, floods, earthquakes, and many other man-made and natural disasters. And, and through that, I tried to adapt technology uh, to make a difference in each one of those situations, right? And, and how technology can be malleable to some extent. Maybe not exactly how you expected to use it going in, but to get an outcome uh, that's an appropriate for the situation that you're facing, right? So while we are in this situation today, I, I feel that some of what I picked up during that time is really applicable uh, to what we're walking through today, especially when it comes to business continuity. So I bet most of you out there um, really have not uh, seen anything like this before. No one really plans for a pandemic event and an economic shock to the system uh, at the same time, right? It's, it's massively disrupted, uh, you know, what we're used to. And I'm sure that a majority of your, you know, business continuity plans, regardless of what industry you're in, whether it be healthcare, retail, uh, whether it be an enterprise, um, or, you know, whether it, you know, be education. It doesn't matter what business you're in. Your planning probably didn't take into account this level of disruption to your business. Um, more than likely, your plans really focused on things like, you know, I've lost a building or I've lost a data center. Um, maybe, uh, you know, a location is off, offline. Maybe even a city has receive some kind of impact that is causing you to reevaluate how you do your business. And a lot of those times, we looked at technology in those plans really as a bridge between the event happening and some restoration of services somewhere else potentially. And that could have included you know, things like work from home, like we're experiencing, um, but also moving to a secondary site. Um, or moving a large majority of your team from one physical location to another location in order to continue uh, operations. But you know, today we find ourselves in a strange situation where you know, pretty much we've got 100% of our employee population no longer operating in the facilities that they're used to operating in. Right? And it's not because we've done something wrong, right? In fact, you think about our facilities, the facilities are operating as intended. Uh, our buildings are still there and operating and functioning, right? Our data centers are still online. There's nothing changed in the underpinnings of technology. We just can't get to them. We can't access them. Uh, we can't use them efficiently. So, so this is a very strange norm for us because, again, most planning would have taken into account something going offline. And nothing's really gone offline. We're just working in a different way right now. Okay, so I feel that there's really some key areas that we need to dig into um, that I've been pondering on over the last uh, little while. Um, the end game, really, for any of these is that we have to reduce what I call the friction on the end user. 
right? The user right now is incredibly stressed. They're working in a very different way to what they've been used to working in. They may be inhibited in some way because of that. Right? They've obviously got other issues surrounding them regarding just life in general at this point. Um, so whatever we do as, as technologists uh, to try and help them, we have to do it in a way that is going to try and reduce that friction on them. Right? That, that to me is paramount. And, and to me, I think it really comes down to four other components of these five areas. Right? The, the, you have to look at security. We have to address how we're going to make connectivity work. Um, if we're going to do something with technology, we have to understand how we're going to deploy this technology and make it uh, available to the individuals. And then finally, from an IT operating centric point of view, whatever we do, we have to be able to manage it. Right? And if we can't manage it in a simple way, then we're in trouble. Right? So, so the idea of reducing this friction, right, we must address everything with the idea that the user is paramount to all of these conversations. Right? So let's take a moment and think about security and compliance. Okay. So you know, most of us have very robust security postures um, with you know, documentation, audits, and, and the likes that really keep our systems and services secure and operating. To me right now, we're operating in a diff very different vein. And so to some extent, some of the things that we have maybe included in those, those pro uh, policies, processes, and procedures need to be uh, to, to reviewed with an open mindset. Right? We need our IT infrastructure teams and really our security and compliance teams to come together at this point and think pragmatically about how we can maybe loosen some of the burden. I'm not asking that security posture be thrown out the window, but what I am asking or saying is, is maybe there's a different operating mindset that we have to adjust into right now while we're working through these particular situations in our businesses. So bear that in mind and have those conversations uh, with your, your teams if you're not already having them because there, there's a number of things there that probably um, you should review at this point, right? Um, so if we can get to that kind of mindset of changes, there's some simple things that we may want to look at. Uh, for example, a lot of you may have workstations in your office environments that are now sitting empty, right? The workstations are there. They may even still be powered on, um, but there's no users sitting at the desks you know, hitting the keyboard. And not everybody has a laptop, right? Not every employee has a laptop. Some people have to go to their workstations. So the question there is, with an adjustment in security posture and policy, can I change the posture on those workstations and maybe make the workstation available over the internet? So can I look at how to turn on, for example, remote desktop capabilities on those workstations so that users can log in with their credentials and access the image of their desktop remotely and maybe be able to get some things done? Many of you probably have well-established VDI farms um, that, you know, where you keep these desktop images anyway, and, and you may have a normal routine that that uh, your, a majority of users or a portion of your users use uh, virtual desktops regardless. So for you, that may have already solved itself. You may be able to very easily open up uh, an ability for those uh, desktops to be seen uh, remotely. Another option that I think we should really bear in mind are looking at our application stack. So a lot of us over the last few years have pivoted from on-prem applications to cloud-based services, software as a service, platforms as a service, and the likes. And so maybe things like our productivity tool set, our ERP or HR systems, or even some financial systems may actually be cloud-hosted at this point, and so potentially accessible. Now, previously from security posture, you may have locked those down so that even though they were cloud services, they were only accessible through um, maybe the NAT IP address that you use um, out of your corporate headquarters, right? So that all traffic had to be funneled through a security boundary out to those services. 
maybe you can work with the security teams to, to look at that and adjust some of those postures so that instead of having to route all that traffic through the company, you can go around it, right? get the user connected straight to it. Obviously, a lot of companies utilize VPN services, and that's one very important way to get inside of an organization. Um, but some of those VPN services are probably feeling the strain. Right? A lot of organizations don't grow their VPN capabilities to support 100% teleworking like we're seeing right now. So even though you may have an advantage if you're a multinational over multiple time zones of time of day and people working uh, in different ways, you may be seeing some high watermarks or some bottlenecking uh, or some sheer capacity problems on those services that, that need to be somehow relieved, right? And you're looking for a way uh, to potentially do that. So let's think a little bit about connectivity. Um, you may still be struggling with what I just talked about in terms of maybe loosening your security posture uh, slightly in order to uh, handle some of this kind of new way of working for a little while. But you know, maybe if you can't overcome that, maybe we can look at other ways of doing this connectivity conundrum that we face. So ask yourselves this question. How do we extend the presence of your office securely to now what is a remote worker? Right? And then maybe in that, as a secondary question, how do we relieve some of the pressure that we currently face on the infrastructure that we have? And that's really kind of where I want to focus. So at Aruba, you know, we've been handling situations like this in our products for a long time. right? In some cases, many of the techniques that I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes, you may not have explored because it's not kind of how you would normally expect technology to behave but it's the services and capabilities that we have built into the portfolio. So the first thing I want to remind everyone of is, a, is this very key tenant. Aruba's entire product portfolio is built from the ground up with security in mind. Right? That has not wavered. That never has wavered through the entire life of Aruba. And this has been validated over and over again with many deployments in, in what I would call key industries and even agencies where security is absolutely paramount. So having a strong security underpinning in the products and then being able to present it through clever policy allows a large amount of flexibility on how to pivot some of this technology and maybe even provide some valuable remote services for your users. So how can you use these capabilities in our current situation? Well, firstly, let's try and address VPN. Right? Like I said early, earlier, maybe some of you are struggling just flat out with capacity on your VPN uh, services that you have today for your population. Uh, many of you may have Aruba controllers in your infrastructure, and you probably don't realize or have, or have slightly forgotten that they can act as a VPN concentrator. So Aruba has a client uh, module, a client software called VIA virtual internet access, uh, which can be used to create a VPN client connectivity across the internet to a concentrator where that concentrator has been, I would say, slightly exposed to the internet. I know you're going to kind of call me out here and go, what are you talking about? You want me to expose my concentrator? You must be mad. But you've got to remember, again, that Aruba concentrators, again, with that security mindset uh, in place, by their nature are full layer 7 firewalls. So by adjusting policy, you can limit that exposure to only allow VPN-like connectivity to those controllers. You may already have uh, controllers in your infrastructure that um, might be sitting a little idle right now because they're dealing predominantly with office connectivity for uh, in-building needs. Maybe they can be examined, and, and maybe you can look at trying to, to pivot into this. Uh, idea at this time. So deploying VIA uh, using existing hardware may be a way to add secured access in a VPN-like fashion and increase capacity, um, a capacity you didn't even know that you had. And in some cases, 
if you have multiple controllers at different geographies, different locations around the world, and you're in an ability to maybe change the configurations on those controllers to take advantage of VIA, you could actually do some offloading. So where today you might have all of your users funneling towards a VPN concentrator in your data center and you're seeing your internet or that concentrator uh, become a little bit overwhelmed, maybe by offloading to the regions and then using your internal network to push that traffic back across um, uh, the regions to your hub locations might actually relieve some of that pain point. It's just one option um, that is possible. So I'd like to point this out, that during this unprecedented time, Aruba has made available a special offer of VIA client licenses for up to 90 days without any obligation. Uh, if this can be of help to you, uh, I ask that you reach out to your Aruba account team who has all the details about this. Okay, so moving up the stack a little bit, let's talk about access points for a second. Many of you probably don't know that all of our access points can be configured, and, and I mean all of our access points can be configured to not only operate as an access point in your traditional Wi-Fi deployment on the ceiling grid of your building, but also as a remote AP, or something that we call a RAP. As the name suggests, right, a RAP really is a device that is remote, right? It is in physically in a different location to what I would call the control elements of the network to which it's reporting. So the AP acting as a wrap creates an encrypted tunnel between itself and its central control point, your controller infrastructure or gateways in your data center or potentially in your offices. Again, as long as that controller can be made visible to the internet, then a relationship between a wrap and a business hub can potentially be formed quickly through this simple configuration. So the other advantage is that maybe you need Ethernet. Maybe you've got devices that you need to plug in at someone's home office. So the RAP, uh, many of them uh, configured in this mode, also have Ethernet out ports. So devices can be plugged into those ports. Maybe it's a workstation. Maybe it's an IP telephone that you've allowed the user to bring home so they can make phone calls. Whatever it is, potentially that can also be plugged in to that wrap. And the advantage? Well, the user is not messing around changing configurations on their workstation. Right? They've taken their laptop home. They've created this wrap environment, that wrap, because it's talking to your infrastructure, is responding in a way that they would expect. It looks like, potentially, the uh, same Wi-Fi network as they have in the office. So instead of having to manipulate configurations on the workstation in order to get that workstation talking to the world um, or that laptop, all they've done is set up the wrap, the RAP is advertising their Wi-Fi SSID that they're used to from their corporate office. Their laptop, because it's already provisioned, maybe it's got the right certificates, it's already secured to get on that network, just jumps on that Wi-Fi network. Right? Keeping that friction incredibly low for that user and, and giving a little bit more control to the environment. Now you've got a posture where IT actually has a presence in someone's uh, remote location in their house or wherever it might be, um, that they can administer, right? And they can look at the policy and they can understand what's going on from a performance characteristics. Uh, this could be incredibly helpful, you know, as as people continue to work in in this in this mode. And so, you know, think about how that potentially can help your environment. How you can remove some of that friction from a from a user by handling security through the posturing of wraps at these, at these locations. So OK, um, this sounds too good to be true, I hear you, right? Um, so how do I actually go about getting this stuff deployed, right? This, this, this can't be you know, straightforward, right? You're talking about shoving equipment at somebody's house. I can't get to their house. How do I do it? So amazingly enough, the wraps that we, uh, the software behind it, the technology behind it is incredibly simple to administer. So the IT, IT team will basically uh, provision 
um, in our Activate service, which is a cloud-based service. The access point is drop shipped to the user with very simple instructions that you could create um, to tell them how to plug it into their internet gateway, plug in whatever devices you've given them, and so on. Once that device is plugged in, it calls back to the Aruba Activate uh, capability, gets its base config, it knows then its persona, it knows who it is, it knows what it should be talking to. And once that's done, it creates its tunnel back to uh, the HQ that it's defined to talk to. Right, job done. And the IT staff get to see that device across the network, they get to administer that device, um, they potentially get to change policy upon that device, right? Um, it, and the good thing is that the RAP has, has inherited all of the security posture and policy that you're used to from the office, right? So basically, you have extended your corporate office to another location in a secure way where everyone is still in control and the user gets an ex experience that they're used to seeing. It's incredibly uh, useful from a plug and play standpoint. All right, so I hear you say, um, this is great, it's fantastic, I love the idea of being able to do this, but you know, I can't mess with our hardware right now. We're on a complete lockdown. I can't go and, and change configurations on existing equipment. Okay, that's fair enough. Well, many of us probably have some cloud presence, right? Many of us have already been on a cloud journey over the last few years, and maybe you've got a presence in AWS or Azure um, to ext extend your data center or begin a cl cloud migration of some kind. Maybe as part of that, you've created tunnels from those services back inside your corporate network, or maybe you've um, created, uh, you know, direct connect private network links between those services and uh, your corporate office. So the good thing is we've been working on creating virtual versions of our appliances for quite a while. And so we can deploy in AWS or Azure a virtual gateway. Uh, and so you could look at potentially deploying a virtual gateway, so not necessarily touching any of your physical hardware, nothing to rack, nothing to stack, nothing to cable, Right? and then allow these access points, these wraps, to connect to that virtual gateway, and then from there create appropriate access to get it inside your company network. Right? So maybe not changing the posture, maybe not having to reconfigure physical devices, uh, maybe giving the option to experiment with some of this in, in a way where you can experiment from home um, in, a, in, a, in an easy fashion and try and set something up like this to really, again, make it as, um, as flexible as possible for deployment and you know, frictionless as possible, not only for the IT person, but obviously for the user. Okay, so a lot of us now working from home, we're using all kinds of different productivity tools um, in order to make contact uh, with our other employees to keep that connection going to do our work. Uh, you know, one of the things that a lot of people struggle with is obviously good cellular signal strength. And, you know, I'm one of those, right? And, uh, you know, so I like to look at this in an interesting way in that a lot of the cell providers will allow you to turn on uh, Wi-Fi calling. So even though, you know, to get that one-on-one -on -one connection with an employee or a boss, you know, the cell signal may not be that good, by turning on Wi-Fi calling and routing that across your Wi-Fi network, that may change that experience dynamic considerably, right? And give that user a, another productivity tool in their arsenal um, that they can use successfully uh, during this time. So they may not have a phone at the home. The thing they only may have is a, is a cell phone. And now they're relying on that predominantly for their voice-based communication. So doing things like this potentially can, again, uh, reduce the friction on that user, right, and increase the reliability of that call path considerably during this time. All right, so this all sounds good, but, you know, this, this, is, you know, this is amazing stuff that you've been talking about over the last few minutes. Um, but this, got, this has got to be complicated. Well, you know, I already talked about how we get these wraps online and how we've really tried to, you know, change the dynamic of making it as, as smooth as possible uh, to get those things online as, as quickly as possible. 
Um, but that doesn't stop just with devices. Like I said at the beginning, if we're not changing the dynamic for the management by the IT staff, um, we've got a problem, right? So we have to address that. So what we've been doing is really imagining what uh, the a management plane really needs to look like going forward. And whether you have on-prem management capabilities um, or you know, like in Airwave, for example, and manage your portfolio of Aruba products through Airwave, or maybe you've begun a migration or are full in to Aruba Central. What we've done is really tried to create that seamless management plane as much as possible to smooth the friction that you have from deploying technology to managing technology to getting insights and information out of that technology that helps make your, drive, your job easier. Right? We have to create a secure and a connected and a simple deployed model that is all handled under a simple management plane. And at Aruba, we feel like we've really uh, managed to kind of get that about right uh, by creating both on-prem capabilities and obviously growing our capabilities constantly in our cloud-based services uh, as we move forward to create the right management constructs for you to use in your everyday job. Okay, so we've talked a lot about technology, and you know we are now kind of living in what I'm calling you know the current normal. Um, obviously hoping that we will return to what we call our normal normal in the not too distant future. So Aruba is really here to help us all um, during the time that we find ourselves in. Uh, some of your organizations uh, may be looking at how to potentially kind of get through this by setting up remote locations or expand uh, other capabilities in, in particular ways during this time. Right? Maybe uh, it's, it's how do I handle retail in this new uh, current norm where I don't have an ability to get people in the shops that I'm using a lot more drive up capabilities or fast food restaurants um, where you know, we don't have patrons coming into the stores but just using drive throughs How do I potentially do uh, uh, education in a way that makes sense for my students um, using the technology? Uh, or even uh, how do we handle the needs, the very, very complicated uh, needs of the healthcare industry at this time, right? So we are here to help support that, right? And we've been working with a number of organizations uh, recently in all of these areas to really look at how we can take the Aruba technology and expand it in different ways, changing that dynamic in different ways uh, in order to get connectivity where it makes sense. Right? Maybe that's Wi-Fi dispo uh, dis uh, displayed and extended beyond the enterprise boundary like the wraps that we talked about. Uh, maybe it's adding outdoor APs to an existing indoor deployment right? or creating uh, wrap based extensions to outlying areas uh, of buildings in order to create connectivity that creates that separation need that we, that we seem to be needing at this time. Right? Wi-Fi can be a very quick deploy tool in many situations where wire connectivity uh, of fiber may not be pro possible at this time. Right? So think about clever ways such as how do I do Wi-Fi meshing in order to jump an air gap? How do I jump from a building space across a parking lot to some other place that I need to service? Or maybe a point-to-point Wi-Fi connection. Right? There's lots of different techniques that uh, your account teams can work with you on uh, to walk through uh, uh, potential ways to solve the problems that you're facing right now. So one thing that I did um, when I was in your situation, we created what we called kits. Right? I actually called them lands in a can, which is kind of a weird uh, term. But basically, these were boxes or, or hardened shippable cases with enough pieces and parts in them, uh, access points, switches, cabling, whatever it might be, um, in order to set up an operation remotely. So as a central IT organization, maybe you're looking at um, how do I do this for 
uh, my retail environment? Do I, do I, can I set these kits up and get them out to my retail environment in a way uh, that makes sense, right? Or into the hospital, or even into, into education. How do I do distance learning in a way by creating a repeatable kit of items? And these kits can include all kinds of things. Depending on your business, it could be that you need barcode scanners in those kits. It could be uh, that you need IP telephones or even additional laptops. Uh, really, that kit is, is kind of defined by you as to what goes in it. So this land in a can uh, kind of model potentially can be a way of quickly deploying uh, equipment to places where you need it. So particular for our first responder and medical community, Aruba is donating $50 million in product through our healthcare connectivity bundles. Uh, these bundles are designed for rapid provisioning and deployment in hospitals and clinics, in drive through testing locations, in temporary treatment centers, uh, or anywhere else that is crucial at this time. So if you're on this call today and you're a group that is offering medical services and you need to bolster your connectivity at this time, uh, contact your Aruba sales or technical contacts and hopefully they can provide you with more information. So finally, uh, at Aruba, we really abide by a very simple principle, uh, customer first, customer last. I'm sure you've heard that um, many times uh, on webcasts and presentations. In other words, uh, this really means we don't just develop technology for technology's sake. Uh, everything that we do starts and ends with the need of our customers, and that's you. So at this time, I'd like to offer a slight revision to this. Community first, community last. Not only are we working on hardware to support our first responders during this time, but Aruba has started a community of volunteers. Uh, pulling on our great Airheads technical community group, um, they will link available network engineers who sign up um, and are willing to volunteer their time and expertise with frontline organizations that need technology help to sustain, expand, or, or enhance their needs during this time. Maybe there's a hospital or medical facility who needs some help, uh, maybe getting a piece of Aruba equipment, uh, equipment operational uh, for a field deployment, or just supporting ongoing infrastructure needs at this time. So uh, to those listening today, you know, if you are a frontline facility in need of some help, or uh, if you are a customer partner or airhead, who has expertise and wants to volunteer your help in your immediate community, uh, please visit our website at community.arubanetworks.com and register. And we would do our best to match the need with the expertise. Um, your help uh, could really make a difference in potentially literally changing the outcome and also saving lives. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, this is the end of the formal part of the presentation. Um, there are a number of resources, and these resources are continuing to expand almost on a daily basis that we are pushing out there through the website at arubanetworks.com regarding things like networking and how some of this technology that I just talked about uh, can be used. There are use cases and guides about how to do that, um, solutions around how to do some of the things from a business continuity standpoint. And of course, um, some of the things I've talked about regarding the promotions is also listed there. Right. So we're also in the process, and hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll have um, some additional information that our Airhead community uh, is putting out um, that will be published as well, that will go into some greater detail about some of the technologies and capabilities that I've talked about. Um, so that will be incredibly useful resources for all of you on this call to, to potentially look at. Um, so again, if you would like to learn more, please visit the website. And so with that, I'd like to open it back up to Anthony and Q&A. Hey, James. Thanks a lot. That yeah. was really fantastic. Wanted to uh, call out a couple of things that came through before we get to the questions. Um, that uh, I know a couple of folks uh, reached out that they were having issues with the audio. Uh, I, I apologize for that. This uh, presentation is available uh, on demand at, about an hour after we complete here today. So you will be able to access it. Uh, I was also monitoring online on a different uh, machine and did, not experience any, and did not experience any issues. So there's a chance that it may have had to do with uh, the individual attendees' Internet connection. 
Um, so it will be available, and you will be able to get to any parts that you were not able to get to due to the um, audio issues. So I apologize for that, but thank you for reaching out. We do have a couple of questions. Before we get started, James, um, I want to let everyone, everybody know James will attempt to answer as many of these as possible. If we don't have the answer or uh, can't get to your question, we'll be sure and follow up directly at the email address you used to register. So make sure you uh, keep an eye on that if you don't hear your question answered. So James, you ready to go? First question? Yes, sir. Yep. All right, here we go. The first question, does Aruba VMC support Terminate via clients on mobility controller? Ooh. I, I think know. we're going to have to like answer said, that question offline. Uh, let me let me do some research on that. That's um. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No problem. No problem. So we'll be sure and log that one and, and get a reply to the person who asked that question. Here's one for you. Um, I've had challenges with configuring via or a wrap on a controller. Where can I go for support from Aruba? So I, I think the best place to start is obviously uh, look at some of the information that uh, I think is probably still currently on the screen. But on the website, there's been a lot of enhancements over the last uh, few days around uh, how to deploy some of these products. Hopefully that mm -hmm. is there. Also, uh, the Airheads community. Um, that is an amazing resource to go and ask questions, particularly about configurations you may be experiencing. Um, there's probably someone who has also run into the same thing, and they may have some advice. Okay. Fantastic, and thanks for that question. Um, here's one. You talked about the VIA client. Can you tell me more where to get it, question mark? What OS does it run on, question mark? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so VIA is uh, pretty much available in all of the app stores. Um, and again, if you go to the website, the Aruba website, uh, you'll find links to those app stores and the downloads appropriately for those products. Uh, as far as what it runs on, uh, it, it pretty much runs on the plethora of things that you can uh, imagine. So Windows, uh, Mac, uh, iOS, Android, uh, and even some variants of Linux are also supported. Fantastic. Here's one. For wraps to work, is activate and a physical controller required? Let me follow up on that. I don't believe so, but let me follow up with that one. Okay. Yeah, not a problem. So we have those, uh, both of those logged as we'll, we'll follow up. Um, what other advice or tips can you offer for times like these? And then in parentheses, <laughs> it says disaster recovery. Oh my goodness! Uh, I, I mean, that's uh, yeah, that's uh, I guess the first thing, right? And this is something that someone said to me many years ago um, during something I was dealing with. They said Semper Gumby, right? And um, you know, which is a play in obviously Semper Fi um, from the Marine Corps, but uh, Semper Gumby means basically always be flexible. Uh, and I think more than anything, with what you're doing, don't lock yourself in. Think very far outside the box. Um, be willing to experiment. Understand that you may create a service that isn't what you would normally call, um, you know, kind of bulletproof, right? You haven't got all of the operating procedures and this, that, and the other down, but it does the job. It fills the need right now in this moment. So I think, you know, again, being flexible, uh, making sure that you adapt to uh, the ever-changing uh, surroundings that you're in. Uh, are very important, and understand that you know technology can be a bit of a Swiss Army knife. Um, so you know you may have bought a product to fit a purpose, um, but you may be able to adjust it in order to create something very different for your user community. Um, so you know again, it, it, that's a really hard one to answer. I think it all depends on what you're walking through, but but flexibility more than anything. And that goes back to, you know, like I said, security posture, goes back to what equipment you may want to use, um, obviously how you want to try and get this stuff out there in the field. Um, you know, ju just be flexible, right? And, and, and make the most of what you've been given. It's, um, you know, there's that great scene uh, and great uh, story from Apollo 13, right? Where they have to make a, um, a breathing apparatus in order to clear the air of the, of the space capsule. 
And, you know, sometimes you end up in those kind of situations where you know, you're up against the wall. These are the things I have at my disposal. Okay, let's go for it. Let's see what we can do. Let's think outside the box. So, I, yeah, that's kind of my approach to this. Yeah, no, and it's a good point. We're, th this is all happening to everyone, but our experiences are very different. So um, that, that's the same for your business during times like these as well. Thank you for that, James. Uh, this is a question I can answer, so I'll go ahead and take it. Uh, is this presentation recorded? Absolutely. Uh, it's being recorded right now. We will make it available on demand. I will tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, I did want to get to this question, James. Um, you talked about the LAN kit um, to set up in remote mm -hmm. locations. Can you give details on what should go into one? Yeah, I, so again, you know, go back to my flexibility statement. You know your business. You know what your business needs in order to be successful, right? So um, when I was building these things for, um, say, a news gathering team, right, it, it required, um, you know, access points and switches and cabling and uh, IP telephones um, that were registered back to our HQ uh, and, and even some additional laptops, right, things that um, – you know, may uh, may be needed for people to to just sit down and work at. So, it's it's. I would say it's really kind of flexible based on what environment you operate in, and you know your business better than anybody. Um, but you know, again, I'm more than happy to have those discussions and try and help uh, uh, organizations or individuals through that um, uh, through the questions. If if you have additional questions, um, we'll uh, we'll try and answer some of those situational uh, questions with you. Um, but you know, having a, a, apart from anything, make sure it's shippable, right? I mean, people don't think about um, you know putting this stuff in hardened cases so that it can be basically rattled around a lot and still come out the other side working. Um, you know, I, I've seen things get completely banged up uh, in shipping, and the cases look awful. But you know, the equipment survived, and it served its purpose. So you know, make sure you're even as simple as picking the right box to put the stuff in before you ship it out the door. Hey, James, I have one more question before I get to some uh, housekeeping items I wanted to get to to let folks know um, where they can get more information, something a little more deep dive technical. Uh, as well as the, the webinar series that we're starting with today's first webinar. Uh, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. This is the kind of fun of us doing these, right? <laughs> is someone, someone asked, are you on Twitter? What is your handle? Can I follow? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yes, I am on Twitter. Um, I'll put it out there. It's uh, J underscore A underscore Robertson. Okay, Perfect. so feel free to follow me, may, and um, you know we'll go from there. Yeah, we we may get your followers up a little bit when this is all said and done. <laughs> hey, James, we we do yeah. we do have a couple more questions, but I'm gonna save those, and we'll follow up on those and add those to the other two questions that were asked that we needed to uh, get a little more information to dig down a little bit deeper. But I want to thank you very much. This has been fun. This is the first time we've had you on, and uh, I dare say if you're open to it, we'd love to have you on again. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me, and uh, I hope everyone out there got something out of today's conversation. So uh, I appreciate everyone spending the time with us today. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, James. Um, and if you want a more technical look into what James covered, we'd like to invite you to visit the learning section of our online Airheads community site for portions of our recent technical webinar around business continuity. When the webinar is over today, I'm going to go ahead and put the link to that in the links and attachments. So uh, is, this is being recorded. You just go back to the link that brought you to this webinar and look in the link, uh, links and attachments. It's community.arubanetworks.com forward slash T5 forward slash learning forward slash CT dash P forward slash learning. Once again, if you didn't get a chance to get that, we'll go ahead and put it in the links and attachments section of the console. Uh, I did want to also add that this is part of a series of business continuity themed webinars that we're offering as of today. This is the first. And we're going to be offering one per week over the next several weeks. We invite you to check back on our Bright Talk channel where 
you've seen all of our other webinars. And if this is the first time that you've joined one of our Bright Talk webinars, thank you very much. We have been offering these for a couple of years, and we uh, always invite you to come and, and join us and give us your feedback on how the webinar was. And we're, already we have a few giving feedback. Um, once again, that's going to do it for today's webinar. We love your feedback. Once you disconnect, once we disconnect from this webinar, you'll have a chance to give feedback. Let us know what you thought. Some, I've already read a few, um, loved it. Some thought it was going to get a little bit more technical, which is why we connected you to the Airheads uh, learning page. So go ahead and visit it there. But James, once again, thank you for your time today. And to those watching, thank you. Uh, we're offering these weekly business continuity webinars. You can access those on the Bright Talk channel or by clicking the webinars link at the bottom of our ArubaNetworks.com homepage. Uh, for James, my name's Anthony. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great day.